Hello, my name is Dr. Roderick L. Roll, and today I will be talking about microbial metabolism. Many organisms oxidize carbohydrates as their primary energy source for anabolic reactions. Glucose is the most common carbohydrate used out of all carbohydrates. Glucose is broken down or catabolized by two processes. The first one that we'll discuss is cellular respiration. Then the next is fermentation. We're going to talk about catabolism of other biological molecules in this presentation and anabolism of other biological molecules. The biological molecules that we will discuss are the carbohydrates, the lipids, proteins, and briefly nucleic acids. But the first one we'll look at is carbohydrates. Here is a summary of carbohydrate metabolism. As you can see in this image, we have glucose. Glucose is a carbohydrate. It is a simple sugar. We like to refer to it as monosaccharide. We will break down this glucose and other cells will break it down also, such as prokaryotes. It will break down glucose to pyruvate. Then pyruvate, if it's in a eukaryotic cell like ourself, it will then go through respiration which requires oxygen it will go through respiration and produce acetyl-CoA and then it will be fully oxidized through the TCA cycle the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle the NADH and FADH that is produced will then donate their electrons to the electron transport chain Chemoosmosis will occur and we will generate ATP. Please refer to general biology for a full understanding of this process. In general bio, you prob probably learned about glycolysis. Glycolysis takes a glucose molecule which is composed of six carbon and you will go through these 10 enzymatic steps. The first step is when hexokinase converts glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. What occurred at this initial step was hexokinase, which is an enzyme, took ATP. It took one phosphate off of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and added it to carbon 6 of glucose. Therefore, it created glucose 6-phosphate. So please refer to general biology to understand the process of glycolysis. What's important for us is that glycolysis can be broken down by a process called emden mirhoff parnas pathway, or EMP. So glycolysis is the process of breaking glucose down to pyruvate. And it can occur in several different ways. The first one that you've learned already is the EMP pathway. An alternative to the EMP pathway is the ED pathway. Enner Dordoff pathway. This is an alternative to still generating energy and the pyruvate from the catabolism of glucose. So some bacteria substitute this pathway for the EMP pathway. It was discovered in prokaryotes and the Inner Dorov pathway produces only one ATP, whereas 
EMP produces two ATP. It also, ED, also produces NADH and NADPH. EMP does not produce NADPH. So this one is a little bit different, the ED pathway, the Entner Dodorov pathway. But both of these pathways will break down glucose, a carbohydrate, into pyruvate. But they do it in different ways. So I, I've, I have attached a picture to show you the actual process. Another alternative of glycolysis is the pentose phosphate pathway. It is going to convert glucose to pyruvate, just like the other two examples we talked about. Less energy efficient than glycolysis, produces precursor metabolites and NADPH. It's used to make DNA nucleotides, steroids, and fatty acids. So I have also attached a picture of this pathway. Please look over all three. You have to definitely know the first one, EMP. Now we will look at fermentation. Please refer to your general biology notes to get a detailed description of this. So in the absence of oxygen, in a eukaryotic cell, instead of going through respiration where you go to the uh, preparatory step and then to the Krebs cycle, you're going to bypass that because you don't have oxygen. The purpose of fermentation is to generate NAD so that it can be used in step six of glycolysis or the EMP pathway. So if we look at this picture, we have the pyruvate, a three carbon molecule and no oxygen is present. So the first step, if this is a yeast cell, would be to convert this three carbon molecule called pyruvate into acetaldehyde. Then acetaldehyde will be converted into ethanol and you will generate NAD. Now this NAD will be utilized up in step six of the EMP pathway so therefore you can continue through the next four steps. If we're talking about humans, start at pyruvate and go to the left. You will go over here to production of lactic acid. Again, in both instances, we're not trying to produce lactic acid or ethanol. We're trying to generate NAD. So again, if you forgot some of this stuff, please refer to your notes in general biology. This table here is a comparison of aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. Please get familiar with this table. Other catabolic pathways or other pathways that break down molecules. So we just looked at the one that breaks down sugars or carbohydrates. We also will look at some pathways that break down lipids and proteins because these two biological molecules will also contain energy which will be stored in their chemical bonds. It can be converted into precursor metabolites and it serves as substrates in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. So in this picture you see that we're going to have a portion of a fatty acid, a portion of a lipid be converted into individual substrates 
that will be utilized in gluconeogenesis, the formation of glucose. We also have another component of a fatty acid or a triglyceride that will also be converted into some type of substrate that can be used to make glucose. And over here we have amino acids that come from proteins. They can also come into this process to generate glucose. The first one we will look at is the catabolism of a triglyceride molecule. A triglyceride is composed of a glycerol head, one of them, and it is this three carbon molecule here, and three fatty acid tails, tail one, tail two, and tail three. Another name for a triglyceride is a neutral fat. Here is a enlargement of a triglyceride. Remember from general biology, you also learned about a phospholipid. The difference is you won't have a third tail for a phospholipid, whereas a triglyceride you have three fatty acid tails. We are now going to look at totally breaking down this triglycerides, starting with the glycerol head. So the glycerol is hydrolyzed from the triglyceride by a enzyme called lipase. Glycerol is then converted into dihydroxyacetone phosphate. You remember that molecule from glycolysis. Step four produced it. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate will eventually be converted into pyruvate. So in this picture, you have your glycerol head and you show that we show that the lipase is going to hydrolyze and break that three carbon molecule off. And then glycerol is going to eventually form dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And then that step four of glycolysis is where that long fructose molecule, 1,6 uh, fructose phosphate, will be broken down to DHAP and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this DHAP is up in glycolysis where we had step four occur that split that six carbon fructose molecule into two, three carbon molecules. So same step, were same product from the step in glycolysis. This is just showing that same picture again. Make sure you understand the flow, especially from the first step, which is converting the, glyc the glycerol into the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The second portion of the lipolysis is doing something with the fatty acid tail. So we have three of them in this neutral fat. So we're going to break off these carbons to generate energy. And the process of breaking off these carbons are called beta oxidation. So fatty acid tails obtained from the breakdown of triglycerides and other lipids are oxidized by, through a series of reactions known as beta oxidation. Beta oxidation is nothing more than the removal of carbons and pairs off of these tails of lipids.
Let's review beta oxidation. For each round of beta oxidation, one molecule of acetyl-CoA will be produced, one molecule of NADH will be produced, and one molecule of FADHH will be produced. Some of these molecules you should be familiar with because we have seen them in the Krebs cycle. So let's look at what's happening. We have this long chain of a fatty acid that was broken off or we have a long chain of fatty acid that was broken off of a triglyceride. Then what's going to happen is we're going to create acetyl-CoA. So if this long chain had 16 carbon, this shorter chain now has 14. We broke off two and we added a CoA molecule to it. This is the first substrate that will be used in the Krebs cycle, acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA binds to oxaloacetate in the Krebs cycle. So one round of beta oxidation is going to produce the first substrate for the Krebs cycle. So I drew a 16 carbon molecule so you can understand how this beta oxidation occurs. The 16 carbon molecule is palmitoyl CoA, which is a lipid. So what happens is we're going to have seven rounds of beta oxidation. And after the seven rounds has occurred, what we would have created eight acetyl-CoA molecules, which would each then go to go through the Krebs cycle to produce a whole lot of energy that you should be familiar with if you reviewed your general bio. Those seven cycles must occur for that 16 carbon molecule and it will generate eight pairs of acetyl-CoA. Later on, I'll give you other scenarios where we'll have a 14 carbon molecule and I'll give you the name of that lipid or a 18 carbon molecule and I'll give you the name of that lipid. So again, we have a 16 carbon molecule here going through beta oxidation that will produce a 14 carbon molecule, then a 12 carbon molecule, and so on. So this is the first pair after beta oxidation. Each pair that is lost will generate 5 ATP. How will it generate 5 ATP? You're going to produce a NADH just to generate this first pair. You're also going to generate a FADH H when you generate this pair. We know from general bio that every NADH that we produce, we will produce ATP, 3 ATP. And for every FADHH we produce, we will produce 2 ATP. So that is why we have for each pair lost, we will generate 5 ATP molecules. Each acetyl-CoA produced via beta oxidation would generate those 5 ATP. And this is how. So I drew this little table to help you understand. So in the end, that pair of carbon that was released from that 16 carbon fat will generate 5 ATP. Since palmitoyl CoA generates 7 acetyl-CoA molecules, 
how many ATP will be generated just from these steps. So this time, pause your video so you can generate the total energy. So I want you to put what this value would be here. Beta oxidation from that 16 carbon molecule that will generate seven acetyl-CoA molecules. This is the answer. From the seven acetyl-CoA molecules produced through beta oxidation, you're gonna produce seven NADH, seven times three is 21. Three is the number of ATP produced for each NADH. Then we go to seven FADH that will be produced from the beta oxidation of that 16 carbon molecule. You're going to times seven by two because every FADHH produces two ATP. 21 plus 14 equals 35. So that is the amount of ATP that, we, that will be produced. Now let's look at once we have produced those seven acetyl-CoA, the acetyl-CoA now will go through oxidation through the Krebs cycle. This should be a review for you. So palmitoyl coa produces eight acetyl-CoA molecules via beta oxidation. The first acetyl-CoA will come into the Krebs cycle and bind with acetyl-oxaloacetate. Uh, and you will then form citrate, which is a six carbon molecule. So oxaloacetate is four carbon. Acetyl-CoA is two carbon you form a six carbon molecule called citrate. Citrate forms isocitrate. Isocitrate forms alpha ketoglutarate, but we have a NADH that was formed at this step, step three. Alpha ketoglutarate forms succinyl-CoA and another NADH will be formed. Succinyl-CoA forms succinate. ATP, substrate level phosphorylation, is formed at step five. Citrate, I mean su succinate, will then form fumarate. Step six, Na, uh, FAD will form FADHH. Step six, uh, fumarate will form malate. Malate will form oxaloacetate. At step eight, you have another NADH that will be formed. So for every acetyl-CoA that comes in to the crab, you're going to produce three NADH, one FADHH, and one ATP. Each acetyl-CoA that, that is produced will generate 12 ATP via the Krebs cycle. How? The acetyl-CoA will produce one of those, I mean three of these, uh, NADH, one FADHH, and one ATP. Remember, each NADH will produce three ATP. Therefore, three times three is nine. FADHH, each one will produce two ATP. So there we have two, and then we have one. So a total of 12 ATP for each acetyl-CoA that is produced. So we have that 16 carbon fatty acid tail. So we have a total of eight acetyl-CoA molecules that will be produced. They will be oxidized via the Krebs cycle. And I want you to tell me how many ATP will be produced from that. You should pause your video at this time so that you can address this question.
The answer is 96. So out of the eight acetyl-CoA, if we just look at the number of NADH that were produced is 24. If we just look at the number of FADH were produced is eight. And if we just look at the, the number of ATP, it was eight. You should know how to multiply and figure this out. So the total is 96 energy molecules that will be produced. Now let's look at the total energy produced from oxidation of palmitoyl-CoA. The total number of ATP that, we, that will be produced from that uh, lipid is 131 ATP. How do we get that number? We previously looked at this beta oxidation and we got 35. And then now we looked at if for every acetyl-CoA that was produced from beta oxidation and it goes through oxidation through the Krebs, it's going to produce 96. You just add those two numbers and you get 131 total ATP when you break down that one fatty acid tail from that fat. The fatty acid palmitic acid contains 16 carbons. It is first activated into palmitoyl CoA. This activation requires energy. Two ATP molecules are required for this conversion. Subtracting the activation energy of two from the total energy we just learned, 131, will leave us with 139. So certain books you'll read will say that lipid would generate 129 ATP. Some books will say 131. So I want you to understand why you might see the discrepancy. It depends on if you started palmitic acid or palmitoyl CoA. This YouTube video is a very good explanation of what I tried to explain. When I first learned this in the early 2000, we used our biochemistry book by Zubay. Very good biochemistry book. And the conversion of palmitoyl CoA in our book said that it was 131 ATP were produced from that 16 carbon lipid. You can also see it as 108 over 16. Where is the discrepancy? Why is the discrepancy? How can some books say 108? Well, because we always use three for the magical number of ATP that will be produced from one NADH and we always use the magical number of two ATP in reference to the one FADHH. But realistically, that's not the, the values. So NADH really gives us a range between 2.5 to 3.3. We just pick the middle and call it three to make the math easy. But if you went back and for every NADH that you produced, use the number of 2.5, we would get a different number. For every FADH that we produced, if we didn't use two and we use 1.5, we would get a different number. So in some books, if you see the value of palmitoyl CoA as 108, this is why. Because they didn't necessarily use the number 3 and 2. Like I stated, when I learned it in, uh, in the early 2000s, 
we did not refer to as activation energy to convert palmit palmitic acid into palmitoyl CoA. But your book does mention activation energy, but my book did not. So again, there might be some discrepancies depending on what book you read. Why do fats carry more energy than sugars? We've all worked out. We've all been trained by trainers. And you probably heard them saying that fat has more energy than sugars. So to stay away from fats. Well, let's look at that, that statement. So 15 of the 16 carbons in palmitic acid or palmitate are completely reduced, meaning no oxygen substitution like seen with glucose. Palmitic acid has more hydrogen and less oxygen. All the carbons of glucose have hydroxyl groups. And I have a picture below to show you the glucose molecule and that you can see that each of these carbons have a hydroxyl group. So glucose will have more, high, uh, more oxygen associated with their, its carbons, whereas these lipids will have less oxygen. So this means the glucose, because it has the OH groups, it's going to produce less energy. Now that we have thoroughly catabolized or broken down carbohydrates and we have thoroughly broken down lipids, now we're going to look at proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. So let's break down proteins. Most cells only break down proteins when glucose and fats are not available. Since proteins are too large to cross the membrane, bacteria must first split the protein into smaller amino acids by a protein called protease. In this picture, we have a long polypeptide. And in order for the bacteria to generate ATP, only when glucose is scarce and when fats are scarce, it is going to release a enzyme called protease into the extracellular space. That protease is going to then hydrolyze or catabolize, break down these peptide bonds of this polypeptide therefore generating individual amino acids. That's the first step that occurs. Then the amino acids will come into the cell because now they're small enough. So once inside the bacterial cell, an additional enzyme will split off the amino group from the amino acids. This is called deamination. So the amino group, remember the structure of an amino acid has on one end a carboxyl group, COOH, right here. On the other end is an amino group, NH2. So once this amino acid is, is inside of the cell, Deamination, a reaction involving enzymes, deamination will take off the amino group. And that's what you're seeing here. Then the product, which is here, can then be used in the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. Let's look at deamination, the removal of that amino acid, I mean the amino group from the amino acid. The resulting molecule enters the Krebs cycle and the amino acids are either recycled 
to synthesize other amino acids or excreted as nitrogenous waste such as ammonia which is NH3 or ammonium ions which is NH4 so what we're seeing in this picture is an amino acid that was already catabolized by protease is then going to be converted into this alpha keto acid and when it is converted into alpha keto acid we pull off one of those amino groups to make ammonia this ammonia can then be used to create a different amino acid called glutamate how will glutamate be produced through this process called deamination so we're talking about both transamination and deamination so this alpha ketoglutarate which you've heard of this before is in the Krebs cycle so alpha ketoglutarate is then going to pick up the ammonia group and be converted into a different amino acid then this amino acid glutamate would then release NAD I mean NH3 ammonia and which will be dumped into this urea cycle which will produce the nitrogenous waste so make sure you understand the deamination problem the process where you remove the amino group from the amino acid This is kind of like a uh, uh, flow diagram of what happens in the human liver. Amino acid gets together with a keto acid. And when these two get together, they will form a keto acid and a different amino acid. I just mentioned this in the previous slide where the different amino acid was glutamate that first step was transamination then we have the amino acid is going to give rise to or yield ammonia and a keto acid so the amino acid is going to yield ammonia here's ammonia and a keto acid this is referred to as oxidative deamination this step here amino acid being converted to keto acid and ammonia then finally ammonia plus carbon dioxide which is going to give this oxygen here is going to yield urea urea can build up in the blood but then be excreted by the kidney so this is how our cells break down these amino acids it starts by releasing the amino group from the amino acid through a process of transamination and oxidative deamination followed by the urea cycle to form urea the nitrogenous waste in urine in humans will contain urea uric acid which is the end product of nucleic acid catabolism and creatinine which is the end product of creatine phosphate catabolism now we've discussed breaking down these biological molecules we call it catabolism now we're going to look at anabolism anabolism is the building up of these molecules so I mentioned in general bio what metabolism M 
metabolism is the combination of uh, catabolism and anabolism, the breaking down and the synthesis. So we just thoroughly went over breaking down these molecules. Now let's briefly look at building them up. Anabolic reactions are synthesis reactions, building, which require energy and a source of precursor metabolites. Energy derived from ATP from catabolic reactions. So where does the energy come from when we, when we build these bigger molecules? The energy came from the breaking down of previous molecules. Many anabolic reactions are the reverse of the catabolic reactions. Reactions that can proceed in either direction are amphibolic. In this picture, I have a anabolic reaction. Small molecules are assembled into bigger molecules. Energy is required. The energy came from catabolism of previous molecules. Please get familiar with this table. In this table, we're looking at metabolites versus products or precursors versus a product. So the first one we have is glucose 6-phosphate. We should be familiar with this. It's in glycolysis, uh, the first step. First step, glucose makes glucose 6-phosphate. So the pathway that generates the metabolite was glycolysis. An example of a macromolecule synthesized from the metabolite. So glucose 6-phosphate is produced in glycolysis, but it can be used to make lipopolysaccharides. It's a precursor. It is a metabolite. Here's another one. To generate the peptidoglycan, which is a component of the cell wall, bacteria need to use fructose 6-phosphate, which is step two of glycolysis. Here's another one. A glycerol portion of lipids, where does it come from? It comes from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This is step five in glycolysis, you take that molecule, the three carbon molecule, and you can create the three carbon glycerol that forms part of the lipid. So please get familiar with this table. Here is the second portion of that table. So read through them so you can see how a lot of these substrates become products. A lot of the products require substrates. How do cells make glucose? The process of making glucose, creating new glucose, is called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is a process of making new glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. Step one, glycerol comes from the fatty acid. It comes from a neutral fat. It comes from a triglyceride. Step one, I can convert that glycerol into DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which, uh, which eventually I can create glucose. Glucose is the most important molecule, especially in humans, because our neurons can only process glucose. So you have to generate glucose. You have to either create glucose from catabolism, of what you consumed or you have to anabolism make glucose 
So I'm showing you three processes that make glucose. The processes are called gluconeogenesis, creating new glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. The first non-carbohydrate precursor is glycerol. The second one is the fatty acid tail. It comes in lower down here to the acetyl-CoA, but eventually will produce glucose. And then the third one is amino acids. Comes in here or here, but eventually it will produce glucose. How do cells make fats. Here is a flow chart of the biosynthesis of a triglyceride, a fat and a lipid. So over here, we're going to make the fatty acid. How? Glycolysis will produce acetyl-CoA. Reverse beta oxidation will give us a fatty acid. We can also form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which will then form dihydroxyacetone phosphate that will form glycerol, which can form the triglyceride. And the triglyceride will contain the fatty acid tail and the glycerol head. So here's the glycerol head combined with the fatty acid tail. We form the triglyceride. So this is showing us how to form a triglyceride, how to form a fat, and how to form a lipid. How do cells make proteins? An example of synthesis of amino acids via amination and transamination. If we're going to make a protein and we do not have all of the amino acids, then we have to convert existing amino acids into other amino acids, or we have to convert these keto acids into amino acids. So in order to do that, we need amination and transamination. Please review this picture below. It shows you how a keto acid in combination with this ammonia group will, will produce an amino acid, amination. Where did that keto acid come from? It came from the Krebs cycle. So one of the intermediates, one of the uh, metabolites of the Krebs cycle will generate an amino acid, one that we need to make the protein. Then the transamination, you can have this amino acid. It will combine with oxaloacetate to form a different amino acid. So again, this is in the formation of proteins. We might have to generate certain types of amino acids. How can you generate them? Starting point from a couple of metabolites in the Krebs cycle. How do cells make nucleotides? Please review this chart here. Ultimately, we're trying to make DNA or an, an RNA. It starts off with glycolysis, which will form glucose 6-phosphate, that's step one, which then reforms the pentose phosphate pathway which will then form ribose, I mean ribose 5-phosphate, which eventually will get up to form our DNA or our RNA. Another process is through this bottom flow, which will form this glycine, which is amino acid, which will form a portion of the purine nucleotide. Integration of cellular metabolism is depicted in this picture. Look how all of those cycles are integrated into one image. Please make sure you understand this entire flow, how everything is related, how catabolism is linked to, to anabolism, the breaking down of these bigger molecules into these uh, other smaller molecules 
can then be linked to creating these bigger, larger molecules in the end.